weirdos and welcome back to Creep That with Kate. If you're new here, hi, I'm Kate. And every Saturday I'm gonna be here trying my best to freak you out with my take on all things creepy. It might be a horror movie like tonight. Some weeks it could be a haunted house or maybe some paranormal activity. And other times we're just gonna do some creepy baking. I don't know. But if you haven't seen my other videos, go head over to my channel and check those out after this one. While you're there, maybe hit the subscribe button, give me a like, and let's get started. So, today we're going to be talking about the movie Hereditary. It was just released in 2018, but it has instantly become one of my all-time favorites, probably my top five. I think the other four probably are Legion, Drag Me to Hell, the Ring, and probably The Unborn, which we talked about, I think, two weeks ago. Um, it was Ari Aster's first ever full-length film that he directed. He also wrote it, and to be honest, he did an amazing job. There's so much to this movie. There's tons of foreshadowing and Easter eggs and things that if you haven't seen the movie multiple times like me, you probably would have missed. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. And before we get into the meat and potatoes of it all, I need to hit you guys with some vegetables in the form of a warning. So some parts of the movie can be a bit much and we are going to be talking about a lot of headlessness today. There is going to be some light mention of mental illness and suicide. We are going to talk about some cult activity and there's just going to be a lot of blood and guts. So if any of that makes you uncomfortable, no problem. I totally understand. Maybe go ahead and rewatch one of my last videos, but definitely meet me here next week for something a bit lighter. <laughs> All right, so if you're still here, let's go ahead and get into main course. Um, if you're here, you probably already saw Hereditary, and so you probably already know that there are four main characters, the Graham family. We have the mom, Annie. She's played by Toni Collette. We have the dad, Steve, who's paid, played by Gabriel Byrne. We have the older brother, Peter, who's played by Alex Wolf, And then we have um, his younger sister, Charlie, who is played by Millie Shapiro. Um, they all do a great job, especially um, with all the different highs and lows in this movie. Um, you probably remember the very first scene or the very first image we see is an obituary for Ellen Lay, which was Annie's mom who recently passed away. It says she was 78 years old and she died to a prolonged illness, which is never mentioned during the movie. It says that she was a beloved wife to her late husband and a devoted mother, um, obviously to Annie, but also to a son that we're going to talk about later. Um, after the obituary fades, we get a really nice, clear, long shot of the treehouse, which is really important in this movie. Um, I feel like it's symbolic of the fact that everything kind of starts and ends there. And after a nice long look at the treehouse, the camera pans around and now we're looking at Annie's studio. Um, we zero in on one of her miniatures that she created of the Graham's family home, specifically in Peter's room. We zoom in, zoom in, zoom in and find Peter sleeping. Um, his dad comes in saying, you know, here's your suit for the funeral. Have you seen your sister? Um, and finds out that um, Charlie actually decided to sleep in the treehouse like she oftentimes did. Um, he goes up there and gets her. We see that Annie is already in the car and it cuts to the funeral. So once at the funeral, we get a, another long look at um, the recently deceased Ellen Lay. She's sitting on a couch. She's looking really regal. And then Annie is up to the podium. She's delivering a eulogy in which she says that her mom was a very secretive person, had all kinds of secret rituals, and it felt like an invasion of privacy even talking about it. 
She also mentions that she's really surprised by all the people in the crowd and she didn't even know her mom knew this many people. And there's a reason because she didn't know her mom was in a secret cult and these are all of the cult members, of course. So that's one thing that I missed my first go around that maybe you missed too. Anyways, now we have people all in a line to pay their last respects to Ellen. It's Charlie's turn and she takes a nice long look at Ellen before turning around and seeing a man staring back at her. Um, Charlie looks a little bit confused even though the man seems to know her. I don't think Charlie knows him and I'm pretty sure it's because he's a cult member. I think we even see him later. Um, I think he ends up being the guy standing in the doorway when um, Peter um, first goes into the living room, sees his mom, and then she starts chasing him to the attic. Um, anyways, after that, Charlie goes down the aisle and she starts to eat a candy bar. Um, her dad asks her, does that have nuts? Her mom echoes that, saying, does that have nuts? We don't have her EpiPen. And that's where we get our first clue that Charlie is allergic to nuts, which we'll use a little bit later. Um, before they leave, there is one other image of a lady who seems to have a vial of oil that she puts on her finger and rubs on Ellen's mouth, which is also just an, another uh, clue as to the fact that the cult members are at the funeral and honestly are with the Graham family the whole time. Um, as we talk today, you guys are going to realize something that I thought was genius and just so interesting that the cult is always present. Almost everything that happens to the Graham family is intentional and it is because of this cult. Um, anyways, the Grahams go home. They're standing in the entryway and Annie says to Steve, should I feel sad? Uh, she doesn't know what to feel, which makes sense. Um, and Steve basically says, you know, feel whatever is natural to you. Um, the Grahams disperse into their own little areas, settling in after the funeral. Steve goes and checks on Peter, making sure he's okay. He seems maybe a little bit indifferent. He's playing his guitar. He's kind of just looking and he says he's fine. Um, Annie goes in to Charlie's room and checks on her and Annie is actually looking, oh, I'm sorry, Charlie is actually looking really upset. Um, Annie sits down on her bed and they talk a little bit about what's going to happen to Charlie after Annie dies, who's going to take care of her. Um, but one important thing um, that I got out of this conversation was that um, Ellen uh, favorited um, Charlie and that even when Annie wanted to feed her, it was a big deal because Ellen needed to feed her. Probably because she was payment the whole time, but we don't really know for sure. Anyways, Annie looks up on her way out of the bedroom and she sees a really creepy word um, etched into um, Charlie's wallpaper above her bed, which is another secret thing that you may not have noticed your first time around. Um, there's actually a theme here. There's several creepy words that we're going to see and I'll show you guys pictures. Um, anyways, Annie then goes into her uh, workspace where she works on her little miniatures. Annie's an artist, if you don't already know that. Um, she does these little mini versions of her life and she tells a story through these miniatures, um, which is interesting to me because it's, it's kind of like the Graham family are miniatures in the um, eyes of the cult who's, again, controlling everything that they do. Anyways, Annie, I guess, is feeling a bit nostalgic because of the recent passing of her mom, and she goes over to a box of her mom's things. Uh, she pulls out a photo book, and she only looks through the first couple of pages before putting it down and picking up a notebook. It is called, um, I think, Notes on or Notes of Spiritualism, and inside, right past the cover, she sees a note card um, that is, you know, obviously addressed to her um, from her mom Ellen it basically um, is saying you know forgive me for everything I've done but peep this at the bottom it says 
our sacrifice will pale in comparison to the rewards. So I feel like that was her way of saying the sacrifice of your whole family will pale into comparison of the rewards that my cult's going to get for resurrecting this demon of hell, Payman. Um, anyways, after that, she's had her fill of, you know, memories and she goes and turns off the light. In the corner of her eye, she actually sees a creepy apparition of her mom. She stares at it for a while and then decides to turn the light on. She looks around, uh, probably making sure her mom's not really there and she's not going crazy. And she zeroes in on one of her miniatures where her mom is standing over her with her boob popped out. Annie is in bed with what I believe is Charlie. And I think that this is the scene that um, Annie was uh, talking about to Charlie saying that um, Ellen had to be the one to feed Charlie. Uh, anyways, after that, um, she goes into her room, basically just telling Steve that she just creeped herself out in the um, workshop, and that's the end of that. It's the next morning, and now the kids have gone to school. It starts with Charlie, who is in class, supposed to be taking a test, but instead she's fiddling with a little doll that the first time around we don't know is significant. We don't realize how thick this plot is and how soon things are starting because this doll is then seen on the altar in Joan's room um, when uh, Annie first realizes something is up and goes to confront Joan. Anyways, uh, the teacher approaches Charlie and says, how about we put that toy away? We can maybe play with it after the test. Charlie agrees, but almost instantly afterwards, a bird flies into the window, which is really suspicious because Charlie doesn't seem to be phased by this at all. All of her um, classmates are chattering about it, saying how weird and gross it was, but she just um, sets her sights on a pencil cup on her teacher's desk. Um, the pencil cup has a pair of scissors, which we then see her use to cut the head off of the bird and stick into her pocket. This is one of the first instances of headlessness that we see throughout the movie because as we know, the sacrifice to payment, I believe, is a severed head um, because there are several severed, severed heads throughout the movie. Um, anyways, Charlie turns around and she notices a woman standing quite far away behind a gate um, and kind of does this weird little small wave at her um, that you almost couldn't notice unless you're really looking, um, which is just another instance of the cult always being there. Who knows? Maybe that cult lady summoned the bird and you know, it flew in the window because of that, or maybe she threw it out the window. I don't know, but I do know that they orchestrated it somehow. Uh, anyways, that's it for Charlie's school. Now we go to Peter's school, which I was a little bit confused. Might be the same school. Um, Charlie was 13 and Peter, um, I feel like he's in high school, but I don't know, maybe Charlie was ninth grade, Peter was 10th, 11th, or 12th, I don't know. But I guess it's it's probably the same school. Anyways, we go into Peter's classroom, and they're discussing a book in which the characters are hopeless. They have a predetermined fate, and they're these hopeless characters in this hopeless machine. Just like the Graham family is hopeless characters and sacrificial lambs in the Colts machine. Um, anyways, after that we go back home and Annie is in the shop again. Um, she is looking at a website trying to help her understand the apparition of her mom that she just saw. Obviously, it was really creepy, and so she goes to the website seeking answers. At the same time, she's painting a miniature version of this scene. You can see in her magnifying glass that she has the laptop in a mini version, and it's a red screen just like on her laptop. 
Um, she puts it away when her husband comes home and as she's leaving that room she realizes that her mom's door is open which is really strange. She goes in there and she sees this ritualistic triangle on the ground which I don't know why she didn't have questions then and there but she just closes the door and asks her husband to lock it saying she knows it's weird but it's what she wants. At the same time, Peter comes with the phone and says that the um, mortuary or wherever the grandma is buried is on the phone. Steve takes the phone in the other room and is told that the body of Ellen has been desecrated um, or it has been disturbed, um, which is evidence that even early on in the movie, the ritual has begun. I personally think that it just started with Ellen's death um, because she is the first sacrifice to um, this King of Hell payment. Um, after that, Peter just goes back to his bedroom. He is hanging out. He is looking at some social media website where he has his crushes page pulled up and he's looking at pictures of her. Um, he's smoking weed and he goes to exhale out the window. Uh, we see his uh, white cloud of breath indicating that it's cold outside, but then the camera stays there for a while. And I missed this at first, but there's another cloud of white breath coming from the opposite direction indicating that someone is out there watching him and it's almost certainly one of the cult members just another instance of big brother always watching <laughs> um so after that it goes back to annie she's in the middle of telling steve that she's going out she's gonna go see a movie which of course is a lie she goes to a group which is for people who recently lost a loved one they set aside some time for newcomers at the end and of course Annie decides to speak. She talks about how she'd been there before and it helped so she decided to come again. She talks about how she really didn't have a good relationship with her mom because her mom was really manipulative and cold. Um, and she talks about some of the mental illness um, that her family endured or was prone to. Um, so Ellen, the mom, apparently um, had dissociative identity disorder, formerly known as multiple personality disorder. The brother has schizophrenia, claiming that the mom is trying to put people inside of him, which now we know probably was the case. She probably only had kids in the first place to uh, fulfill her, you know, sick um, ritual. Um, and I think she only had Annie as a failsafe in case things didn't work out with her son and um, Payman couldn't inhabit his body. That way Annie can have kids and they can try again down the line. Um, also, um, Annie's dad was a psychotic um, or had psychotic depression and um, he died by starving himself, which she says sounds as terrible um, or was probably as terrible as it sounds. Um, so after this uh, group, Annie goes home and she's back in her um, little workspace working on her miniatures. That's when Peter comes in and asks if he can go to the party that we heard about earlier. Um, he says it's just going to be some small school get together um, and, you know, there's no drinking, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, Annie suggests that he take Charlie and that's when we go to Charlie's room. Um, Charlie is working on her little figurines like the one that she had um, during that math test at school and I think that this is the first time that we see this shoe of light in the room signifying that payment is present or that um, his mischief is at hand uh, just that I think just that he's there and some shit's about to go down. So this light compels her to go look out the window. She ends up going outside and she sees her grandmother's body sitting in the grass surrounded by fire. Uh, really soon after that, Annie has found her and yanks her saying, why are you outside with no shoes and no coat? And, you know, brings her back inside and tells her you're going to this party. Uh, this is completely against Charlie's will. She doesn't want to go. But Annie says you need to go get some peer interaction, hang out with other kids and your brother. And, you know, so they go. 
Um, they go to this party, they're driving down the street, and we get a very nice, long, clear look at the utility pole where we know Charlie later is going to be decapitated. One thing you probably missed your first go around is that the symbol for payment is right there on the utility pole. It's literally stamped there indicating that this whole thing is a freaking plot because, you know, they get to the party and then again, there's foreshadowing of what's going to happen. The girl is chopping up way too many nuts. I don't know why she has so many nuts. Um, Charlie, of course, wants to go smoke weed in the room with his crush. Um, and so tells Charlie, go get some cake. It's chocolate cake to kind of keep her out of his way. Um, he goes into the room and one thing you probably missed also is that the kids are watching guillotine movies. Um, just keeping along with that theme of headlessness. Everyone's losing their head. Um, after, you know, just a couple of minutes, Charlie now comes in. Of course, she says her throat is closing because she's in anaphylactic shock. She just consumed cake with nuts in it. So now it's Peter's, uh, duty to rush her to the hospital he picks her up rushes out they get in the car and they proceed back down the only road to and from this party now peter is going pretty fast you see the speedometer going um i think like 80 miles an hour or so he's trying to hurry up and get her there save her life he swerves to miss a dead animal in the road and that's when he gets too close to the utility pole and Charlie's head is cut clean off. The same pole, of course, that the symbol of payment was etched onto. And so the, that means that the cult, knowing that this was the only road in or out, orchestrated this plot by putting this dead animal in the street, knowing that Charlie, or sorry, knowing that Peter would have to swerve to miss it, and ultimately Charlie's head would be severed from her body. Um, Obviously, this shakes Peter up and he can't even look back to confirm what's happened. He talks himself up a little bit um, under his breath saying, okay, okay. And then he finally gets the courage to drive home, uh, which he does so very slowly. Um, I assume that because he's driving really slowly on his way out. Then as he gets to the driveway, he's going very slowly again. Maybe he's just not a speed demon and he's driving in the driveway at a normal speed. I don't know, but that's slower than I drive. Um, anyways, instead of alerting anyone because he's in shock, he gets out of the car, he goes into the house, and he gets in bed. He never says anything. He never does anything. He just goes right to bed. Um, in the morning, his eyes are still open, probably um, indicative of the fact that he didn't sleep at all. Who would be able to? And you hear Annie now getting ready to go to the store. She asks her husband if he needs anything and he replies no. So she goes. And then you just start hearing this wailing because now Annie has realized her decapitated daughter in the back seat of the car. Um, she cries all night and she cries into the next scene, which is the funeral, um, where you see them lowering this tiny casket, obviously containing Charlie into the ground. Um, you then cut to the after party or the wake where Char um, Peter, I'm sorry, actually, he doesn't even fully attend. He's watching um, the people through a piece of stained glass in the living room, which is where I think we get the first idea that there is some serious tension now between the members of the Graham family. Um, after that, Peter goes to school and he's just completely checked out, which makes perfect sense. He just lost his sister. Um, he's seeing visions of the rearview mirror in the car after the accident. Um, and then he cuts to going on a break, um, probably between classes where his um, group of friends is smoking weed again under the bleachers. Um, he has this really weird episode. I looked for one of the lights um, indicating that payment was present, but I couldn't find anything. 
Um, so I don't entirely know what was happening, but he has an episode similar to the anaphylactic shock that uh, Charlie incurred at the party. Um, he seems to be choking and he even says he thinks his throat's getting bigger and asks his friend to hold his hand. Um, after that, we see Charlie um, go home on his bike. He probably doesn't want to use the car anymore after what happened. And he stands outside with his hands down, kind of clenched, seeming to get the courage to go inside and possibly face his mom. I could understand that. Um, but after Peter goes inside, that's when um, Annie starts the car ignition and drives off. Um, Probably she wasn't quite ready to face him either, especially because of the way things went down, where he just left the scene the way it was, and they probably haven't um, talked about it since, to be honest. It was a really traumatic event, and so it makes sense. Um, anyways, now um, Annie is on the way to the second meeting for um, people who have recently lost a loved one. Um, we see her sitting in the parking lot, kind of hesitant to go inside, and I think ultimately she decides to leave. That's when we see Joan um, go in front of her car to prevent her from leaving, putting her hands on the hood, and then walks over and proceeds to talk to Annie. Uh, this is the first time that we meet Joan, but if you um, look really closely, I do believe Joan is sitting on the left side of the circle in the first meeting, which she says. She says, hi, I recognize, recognize you from a couple of months ago. Um, how are you doing? Uh, where are you going to come inside? Annie lies and says, no, I was going to go get something. Um, and she also says um, that's not about her mom. She's not here now because of her mom. She's here because of the recent passing of her daughter. To which Joan replies, uh, probably as a lie now that I'm thinking about it, saying that her son and grandson recently passed away in a drowning as well. Um, this is an in for Joan to give Annie her card um, saying, you know, if you ever need to talk, um, see me. And um, after this, um, she obviously goes home. Um, she is in her study and we see a light shine um, kind of from the back of the room. And this is where, uh, free of reason, the paint falls over um, directly on to the phone number from Joan. Uh, prompting Annie, of course, to pick up the phone number and take a look. We saw that light from payment, and this is just another, um, another situation where everything in their life is being manipulated down to making her want to contact Joan to keep the cycle going. Um, anyways, another um, eerie thing around this part of the movie that we may have missed was a little seance card being pushed in the mail slot uh, perfectly um, in the right direction so that someone coming to grab the mail can see what it is, probably putting a little bit of an idea or a seed um, into Annie, um, Annie's head, hopefully. I'm sure that that was their point um, because that's the only thing that comes in the mail slot at this time is that little strategically placed uh, flyer. Anyways, next Annie decides to go to Joan's house. Um, she tells Joan about how she found um, Charlie's body and how her head was missing, but it was her clothes and it was her little hands and her little fingernails. <laughs> That makes me so sad. Um, but, you know, they have a good conversation. Um, and I forgot to tell you guys, on the way in, that's when Annie first realizes um, that there is a mat uh, that she says her mom used to embroider or look like ones that her mom used to embroider, to which Joan, of course, just nonchalantly, you know, wipes off or whatever the terminology is, something off, <laughs> um, shrugs off um, because she's not going to flat out say, yeah, your mom's the queen of our cult and she made that for all the cult members, you know? <laughs> 
Um, so anyways, Annie goes home and she's back in her office again. And this is where um, her husband comes in and notices that she's working on a scene of the accident saying, oh, you're not going to let Peter see that. And she makes a joke saying, what? It's a neutral view of the accident. Um, anyways, it's, I don't know, uncomfortable that she made that. But I guess everyone works through things the way they do. Um, he says, are you coming to dinner? She says, I'm not making dinner. And he says, I made the dinner. I'm coming to get you. Come, don't come. I don't give a shit. Because by now, I'm sure he's fed up of her crap. He lost his daughter too. And she never really acknowledges that. Neither of them do. So they go to this really awkward dinner where um, Annie makes some kind of a sneer. And um, Peter notices it. And so he asks about it. Like, Mom, is there something you wanted to say? Release yourself. And she says, no, you mean um, you want me to release you? And... Um, uh, Steve shuts it down, you know, basically saying that's enough and that's the end of that. And then um, it seems to be the next day, Annie has gone out to the local craft store to get some crafts for her miniatures when she mysteriously sees Joan. Uh, Joan is absolutely giddy and one thing you might have missed is that her trunk is full of chalkboards. Uh, later in the seance, she says that the chalkboard for Louis was his link, but I don't think that there ever was a Louis. I don't think that there ever was chalkboards. I think that she honestly just bought this and this was all a ploy, just like everything else in the movie is. Anyways, she tells Annie about this open seance where all these skeptics were permanently changed. She asked the leader of the seance to come back to her house and they end up conjuring her grandson. Um, Annie is really reluctant at first, but obviously she ends up going back to Joan's house and they uh, conduct the same seance. Um, there's some writing on the board, but it might not even be her son. Um, I did a little bit of research for this video and some other people are saying that the son's name was Louis because it was maybe short for Lucifer. Maybe there was some kind of other demonic satanic spirit that was writing to try and convince Annie that it was Louis. Anyways, Annie gets freaked the hell out. She wants to leave, but not before Joan sets her up to ruin her and her family's life and help them evoke the spirit of payment. She says, you know, here's this paper with these words. I don't know what language it is. Just make sure you say it very clearly. She tells her how to conduct the seance to have something that belongs to Charlie. Make sure your whole family's in the room so they can get fucked also. Um, and so Annie leaves. Um, that night, Annie has a really disturbing dream. Uh, she sees ants crawling on her bed. The ants lead to um, Peter, which then are all over his head like they were on Charlie when it flashed to um, her head on the ground at the accident. Um, anyways, uh, she wakes up and it ends up being like a dream within a dream. She's then covered in the paint thinner that she talked about earlier in the movie, trying to set him on fire and then finally wakes up um, from her dream. She's still in her bed, but she decides to go and wake up Peter and wake up her husband and they uh, do a seance. Although this time it's a little bit weird. Um, the um, fire from the candle blows out. Um, there's broken glass and this time Annie's body was inhabited by the spirit of Charlie which didn't happen to Joan. Um, anyways, she ends up having to be awoken from this trance by Steve who flashes water in her face and Annie doesn't seem to know uh, what happened. Um, after that, it's the next uh, day, and we see a picture of another creepy word. I think the final one, if I'm not mistaken. And um, so now Peter is back at school, and this is where things get pretty creepy. He sees a light on the floor. It um, engulfs the room or goes around in the whole room, and then it ends on this hutch next to him. He looks around for the source of the light and then finally looks back at the hutch 
where a smiling version of him is looking back at him. He has a grimace. He has a straight face the whole time. And then there's this smirking reflection of himself that he's seeing. Uh, the the uh, smirk I noticed even grows a bit, indicating that it is operating totally freely of Peter, which is the first really creepy thing that happens after the ritual because I believe once Charlie died, payment was kind of just up in the air and they had to do this seance to draw him into the family. I think kind of so that they, um, Payman knew that this was like the next goal kind of because um, I think I need to let you guys know now down the road it says that Payman um, inhabits the uh, weakest host or the most vulnerable host and so everything that happens from here on now I feel like is a sequence of events trying to make Peter specifically the most vulnerable person around so that Payman can inhabit his body. Um, anyways, he calls his dad um, saying how freaked out he was um, by the seance and just how things were happening. Um, the dad calls Annie and they get into a bit of a fight which isn't really talked about after that. It just cuts to a scene where Annie now is approaching Charlie's room and you see some scribbles appearing in a notepad. Um, after that, we go to Peter's room and this is where he has one of his creepy apparitions that's no doubt brought on by Payman. Um, one of his powers amongst, you know, the other many is to make people see things or to make things appear. And so that's what he's doing. And I believe that that's what Ellen was in the beginning when Annie saw her and um, the rear view mirror, everything that they've been seeing, I believe was strategically placed there um, by payment to just break them down. Anyways, he sees um, his sister Charlie off in the corner in the shadows um, her head starts to fall off and as it hits the ground it turns into a ball which the family dog then barks at um, at this point Annie is fully in the room uh, sees the pictures of Peter and they're pretty gruesome uh, Peter's crying in some his eyes are X'd out his mouth is open as this as if he's screaming and this is when um, Annie really gets an idea that there's some shit going down. So she takes the book and hesitantly she decides that this is a link and we have to get rid of it. She tosses it into the fire and seconds after it is slightly engulfed, her arm catches on fire. And um, of course she fishes it out of the fire with the little poker and she frantically goes to Joan's house to be like what's up like what the hell did I bring into my house what did you tell me to do um she knocks on the door reminiscent of the chopping of the nuts in the beginning of the movie and her banging her head on the attic in the end of the movie um she realizes that this embroidered rug on the ground that Joan never acknowledged is definitely in some way or another connected to her mom it's just like the rugs um we don't see Joan because she's not home but we do get a look inside of her house where it's decorated with white linens and candles um there are ritualistic symbols all over including the symbol of payment on the wall and the table where they did the seance has been turned into an altar it is staged with all of Charlie's toys in the same scene as we're going to see at the end where they're, you know, officially summoning payment in the treehouse. Um, the uh, head of the bird that she cut off is on one of the toys, uh, symbolizing her head on the statue of payment in the end. Um, and the picture of uh, Peter with his eyes hollowed out is on the table as well. Um, she obviously is freaked out. She's got to do something. So she goes home and she's looking through the box of her mom's things. This is when she decides to take a closer look at the books and she gets one and opens it up to a page that's bookmarked with 
uh, the ritual for summoning payment. It says that once the ritual starts, he'll inhabit the body of um, the most vulnerable host. And at the end, it says that he specifically wants a male host which kind of um, opens Annie's eyes to what's going on a little bit more. Um, in another page, it talks about untold riches that he has. It says on the page that he's the um, demon of mischief. Um, some of the other things that he can do are flying undetected. Um, some like real life works, like in our real world works, um, say that he is the governor of fish. He um, controls 200 legions of spirits. He um, has the power to stay underwater for an indefinite amount of time. So he's definitely a powerful, he's um, said to be one of the eight kings of hell by Joan later on. But anyways, um, so this prompts her to look at another book and she's looking at the family photo album which she looked at briefly in the beginning but now she's gotten deeper into it and she realizes that these are pictures of her mom at the cult meetings with the cult members there's pictures of her mom and Joan there's a really creepy picture of the Graham family and then the cult members looking at the picture of the Graham family looking at you know what's to be um their sacrifice sacrificial lambs. But there's another really eerie picture of Ellen dressed in white garbs and looking just really regal and it looks like they're exalting her with some gold coins which makes sense because I feel like it was probably the highest honor for her to volunteer her family to summon payment. That's why she was uh, the cult's queen. And this is them exalting her and thanking her for sacrificing her family to call their god. Um, uh, Annie, after this, um, she leaves and she decides to go up to the attic to check out like what the hell is going on. And that's when she sees her mom's headless body. At the same time, we go to Peter's school and um, this is where he's on break. He's sitting at a bench and we faintly hear his name being called. It gets louder and louder until he realizes that someone is indeed speaking to him and he looks to the same fence where the weird cult member was um, when Charlie was cutting off the bird's head and Joan is there talking to her. She's saying some weird words, some of the words that were actually written on the walls that we saw earlier. And she tells Peter that she releases him and to get out. Um, obviously, I feel like this is a ritual to release Peter's spirit from his body and make way for Payman. So it's a shell and Payman's ready to inhabit the healthy male host. Um, anyways, after that... Um, Peter's break is over. He goes back to school. He sees um, an overwhelming light. Um, again, the indication that payment is present. He's in class and all of a sudden his hand goes up. It's really contorted. His face is distorted and he looks like he's in obvious pain. Uh, all of a sudden after that, he bangs his head on the desk and ultimately, I think, breaks his nose. His dad goes to pick him up and this is where his dad um, is in the car bringing him home and just completely breaks down. I don't think we noticed throughout the movie that nobody checks on Steve. Steve lost his mother-in-law. Steve lost his um, daughter. Steve's family is falling apart and he's just having to deal with everything on his own. Um, Annie was waiting outside. Obviously, she was creeped out by the discovery of her mom's body. Um, and so she goes and waits outside under the treehouse, which is when she sees her husband coming home and goes over to the car like, what the freak? You know, what? Um, what's happening? What's wrong with him? Um, and anyways, they put him to bed. They go inside and Annie begins to tell him about the notebook and everything that's going on. Go check the attic. Um, he goes and checks the attic and he sees the body and because there is a history of mental illness in Annie's family, he being um, a therapist or a, I believe it was a psychologist, um, 
obviously alludes to the fact that Annie's having a psychotic break. She must have been the one who desecrated her mom's body and she's explain, displaying some unhealthy behavior. Um, Annie goes on to, you know, tell him about the book and how her arm caught on fire and that he needs her to throw it in the fire for her. Um, she knows that she's going to die, but she's trying to sacrifice herself. And so she gets really emotional telling Steve, I love you. You're the love of my life. So on, throw it in the fire. Steve says, no, this is not conducive to your mental health. This is, you know, not uh, healthy and decides not to. She then takes the book and throws it into the fire, sacrificing her own self. And this is where her mouth opens and she's flabbergasted at what she's seeing because Steve is actually the one engulfed in flames instantly, not just a piece of his body, his whole body, and he's instantly crispied. Um, anyways, uh, the same light that I've been talking about, Payman's light goes over her, washes over her, and all of a sudden she is completely calm, even kind of smiling. And I feel like because at this time, watching her husband burn to death, she was the most vulnerable host. And so I think temporarily, Payman inhabited her body. Um, anyways, next we cut to Peter's room and Peter was sleeping. He wakes up probably because he heard a noise and begins to get out of bed. Now, one creepy thing that you guys probably missed, I missed it like four or five times because I'd only watched the movie before on my phone and I finally watched it on a television where the lighting was different. But up in the corner behind Peter actually is Annie. She's crouched on the wall and it's just, oh, it's really creepy. So he begins to get out of bed um, and that's when Annie um, crawls out of the bedroom, really just looking very creepy again. Uh, Peter goes out of his room down the hall where there's no ladder, by the way, and um, notices that his grandma's door is open and closes it because obviously he's creeped the hall out. Why is his door open? He goes into the living room then and he realizes his ch charred dad is there and he starts to cry. He hears a noise, which I believe is Annie falling to the ground and, you know, going in front of him. But when he looks back, he sees that naked cultist that I told you guys about before at the um, funeral, the one that was looking at Charlie. Um, I feel like the cultist was probably there to keep Peter from running in that direction and ruining the rest of the ritual because then Peter looks back and Annie chases him to the attic where now all of a sudden the ladder is down. Thanks for your help, cult. And he hurries up and crawls back up and puts the top on so that she can't get in. And that's when she's on all fours banging her head against the wall like I talked about. So the banging is the nuts and then the door and then her hitting her head up against the door to the attic. Uh, once Peter is in the attic, he sees all the creepy shit that's going on, breaking them down, you know? So he sees the candles, which is really weird. Um, he goes over and he sees the white chalky imprint of where his grandma's body once was with the symbol of payment on the wall, with um, his picture with the eyes cut out um, in her place, you know, on the ground. That's when she, he starts to hear something and he looks up and it's his mom levitating at the opening to the attic, holding a piece of um, piano wire, which you guys maybe missed. They do zero in on the piano um, when uh, Peter's in the living room and they do show the loose wire um, or string, piano string, whatever. Um, she has it and she's pulling it back and forth because she's using it as a garret to decapitate herself. Um, so he's watching his mom cut off her head. He then hears a noise and he sees a bunch of naked cult members smiling at him. This is what finally breaks him down, sends him over the top and to get away from them, he jumps out the window seemingly to his death. He falls face first into the ground and that's when we see the light of Payman slowly floating over to him, lands on his back, and he seems to absorb it, signifying that now um, Payman has entered him. Um, this horrific scene brought Peter to his true breaking point and made him the most um, 
available host or whatever word I've been using, but I mysteriously forgot. So now payments and happening in him, he opens his eyes and looks up just soon enough to see his mom's headless body levitating up the ladder to the treehouse and he gets up and you know ends up following suit. Um, he first does the um, cluck that Charlie does throughout the movie like um, which is another kind of cool Easter egg or treat that Ari Aster gave us because Payman supposedly um, translates into a tingling noise. Um, obviously, the cluck is not very tingly, but um, it's still a nod to the fact that that's his name. It is a noise. Um, anyways, so now we know that he's being inhabited by that cluck. And he is walking along this path which is lined with more naked cult members smiling at the um, events that are about to ensue. He slowly climbs up the ladder and when he gets up there, he sees all the cult members. Some are clothed, some are naked. They're all bowing down towards him. Uh, he turns around pretty slowly and that's when we get the first shot of this statue of Payman. It is staged in the way that texts show or say that he appears. Um, he has a staff. Um, he is wearing a crown. The head of this statue is actually Charlie's severed head. Um, he has the symbol um, symbol of I think prosperity or like purity that Jesus holds up um, but he has it inverted because at the end of the day this is a king of hell and this is a satanic ritual. Um, there is actually a bird in a cage off to the side which I'm wondering now uh, whether maybe it was the resurrected pigeon whose head was cut off for the ritual um, because one of Payman's supposed um, powers is to temporarily resurrect things. Um, you get a picture of Queen Lei or Ellen, the grandmother, sitting in a chair, again, looking very regal. Um, and you look down then, or he looks down, and we see his headless grandmother um, with a very decayed body bowing towards the statue of Payman. And then we see his mom with her recently severed um, or her headless body um, and obviously very bloody because she just lost her head a couple of minutes ago. She's bowing down towards the statue of Payman. And then um, you see Joan in the background um, taking the crown off of Charlie and placing it on Peter's head, um, telling him not to be afraid. Um, they have been... Um, uh, they looked to the northwest um, and summoned him. It says they reject the Trinity and pray devoutly to um, him. Um, it talks about oh, uh, bring us good familiars, bring us honor, um, and uh, bend all men's will as we have um, basically bent to yours or something along those lines. Um, and then the ritual is complete. And after that, there's a really eerie echo of just... Um, and it cuts out and it starts to zoom out, like I said, and look nativity-esque. Um, with the warm light, the warmth usually indicates, you know, happiness and good and there's a glow, but it's this horrific, um, satanic scene that is occurring. Um, and then that's it. That's the end of the movie. Um, I hope that some of the things that I said you might have missed encourages you to go watch the movie again, but don't watch it too many times. I watched it quite a few times getting ready for this video so I can make sure that I had the events in line for the most part and that I remembered and that I could talk about the movie after all. I actually overwatched it and I haven't been sleeping and I've been kind of um, 
scared. So <laughs> um, next week, I'm definitely going to do something a lot lighter. I'm going to find something that's a little creepy, but not quite as creepy as satanic cults because those are, in my opinion, the most creepy because they're, you know, quite possible um, versus like, you know, some monsters, while they're possible, they're a little bit less likely. Um, anyways, if you guys are still with me, you've been here for at least an hour. I don't know how long this video is, but I do know that I have at least one 15 minute part and one 16 minute part, and that's just two parts. So <laughs> thanks for being here and supporting me. Um, please leave comments with things that I missed that you saw, things that you missed that I saw, um, maybe what you would want me to talk about next time. Um, and bye. I hope you guys have a great night.